Welcome to another edition of the African Transformation Spotlight, brought to you by the African Center for Economic Transformation. We are an African-led, African-driven economic policy institute based in Accra, Ghana, working across the African continent and connected to the world. My name is Belinda Ayamga. I am communications manager here at Asset, and I'll be your host for today. Now, Asset has just launched what we call the African Transformation Index, a tool that measures how well African countries are performing um, and transforming their economies and improving the lives of their citizens. But you might ask, what does economic transformation really mean and why does it really matter for Africa's future? Today, I am joined by Assets Director of Research Policy and Programs, Dr. Emmanuel owusu Setre who would bring us insights into what this um, African Transformation Index is saying and why we should take it seriously. So welcome to the spotlight, Emmanuel. Thank you. Good. Now we're going to jump into the main findings of the index in a minute. But before that, the ATI report reveals some really surprising and worrying trends you know about africa's economic transformation so for instance it shows that african countries have become less diversified and more dependent on on commodities since um, 2000 so emmanuel before we go into the findings can you explain to our audience what the ati is and what it measures exactly okay. All right, so your, your question is in two parts, what the ATI is and what it measures. Yeah. The ATI is a tool that measures the uh, economic transformation trajectory or journey or performance of some 30 African countries uh, in economic transformation. Okay, so um, how are they transforming? Are they transforming? Are they making progress? Are they retrogressing? Now, it covers um, 30 countries uh, that represent 86.5% of Africa's GDP. Okay, and uh, the, the sample period is from the year 2000 to 2020. The first version of it came out in 2014 and measured 24 countries. But we've been trying to build up on the data set, subject to data availability. Africans mm -hmm. don't keep very good data. So as and when data becomes available, mm -hmm. we add up on the countries. Mm -hmm. So it captures 30 countries from 20, the year 2000 to mm -hmm. 2020. The framework that it's built on is called what you call the growth with debt framework which is designed by asset. Economic transformation is a generic definition, uh, reallocating economic resources from low productivity sectors to high productivity sectors. And mm -hmm. asset offers a framework for achieving that, which is what we call growth with debt. Now, debt stands for diversified production and exports, export competitiveness, labor productivity, uh, technological upgrades, all of which must result in improvements in what human well-being. Mm -hmm. So that's how, that's what the ATI is. That's the framework on which it's based. And that's how it captures the journey of Af African countries mm. in economic transformation. All right. So let's turn to some of the findings of the ATI. Um, as I mentioned before, declining diversification, for instance, and, and competitiveness across Africa. What do you see from, from the report as the main drivers and consequences of some of these trends? And how, how do we reverse them? Okay, so let, let's start with diversification. We produce primary commodities for exports. In other words, our food, agriculture products, natural resources, or oil. We don't add any value to them. So on a scale of 0 to 100, um, which is how each of the sub-indices are measured, you will notice that um, we've performed very poorly. The score on diversification dropped by six points across the continent, like mm -hmm. average across the continent. But for countries like Ghana, Zambia, and Tanzania, it dropped more than 15 points or more. The reason being, Zambia, for instance, is very dependent on copper. Ghana, a few, a few products. If you look at about 84% of our total exports uh, is constituted of our top five exports, all of which are primary. Oil, fruit and nuts, um, wooden products, etc. All of them in their primary states. No semi-processed or finished goods. Mm -hmm. So um, our economies are very also likely dependent on natural resources on the African continent, our gold and our, you know. Uh, so so um, we score very low on the, diversity, the diversification uh, sub-index. Mm -hmm. In terms of export competitiveness, uh, in the, so in, in the index, the index measures that diversification as the array the increasing array of goods and services that you produce for export. So we don't produce any wide array of goods and services. 
if 84 percent of your exports are captured by your top five primary commodities and obviously a very narrow scope of products that you, you produce mm -hmm. in terms of export competitiveness we look at the the a country's non-extractive exports compared to other countries and if you look at the early transformers in asia for instance the economies are very broadly diversified um, countries like uh, singapore south korea um, vietnam they, they are very diversified economies africans mm -hmm. know in terms of export competitiveness as well they are three times as competitive as uh, uh, than more competitive than the global average mm -hmm. africans are half as competitive Okay. So, so we are totally, and the reason being that because you export primary commodities, you are price takers. Mm. You don't export semi-processed or processed goods. So the market tells you the price that they will, they will charge. Mm. Now, why do we have such a low level of uh, diversification and export competitors? I'll take it from four perspectives. First is the institutional dimension, where if you go to most African countries, you have well-designed uh, development strategies, growth strategies of different kinds, but implementation has never seen the light of day. Okay, so they just documents gathering dust, nobody has implemented them. The second closely related point is that these documents are designed by different governments and they are not apolitical in nature. So a new government comes into power, throws away everything done by the previous <laughs> government. So new king, new law, new crowd, new development agenda. Okay. So as countries, we keep moving in circles instead of moving forward. They have the production dimension. If you come to the production dimension, we don't have the technology, we don't have the skill set, we don't have the infrastructure. If you look across the continent, we are currently struggling with uh, sustainable energy supply. Electricity is a challenge everywhere you go, mm. right? In Ghana, we call it doom so. In South Africa, we call it load shedding. They have a nicer name for it. But we can't keep the lights on. That badly affects manufacturing. So if you want to, want to add value to your product, you don't have, you even have the energy to do so. They have the technology as well. We produce cocoa, for instance, in Ghana. We want to go into chocolate production. Do we have the machinery? Do we have the technology? Do we have the skill set? Do we have the expertise? We don't. You see, so these are production factors that come in there. Then you go to the market. Our access to markets are very limited. Okay, we don't have adequate access to markets. Uh, we can't meet the all kinds of non-tariff quality assurance based kind of barriers subtle barriers that block us from good markets so we can get our products out there all right the, and, and if you look at cross-border infrastructure for instance moving goods across african countries it's extremely difficult because mm. the cross-border trade infrastructure is also very bad so access to markets is sabotage it is said that it's easier to move a container from china to nairobi east part of africa than from south africa to the west of africa mm. It's faster from Asia to Africa than from within the yeah. continent, you know. And the fourth one is access to finance. It is very difficult to come by patient capital that can invest in the SMEs to, to, to develop themselves, to develop the right technology, the right products, and, and compete and grow gradually. You know, so these are four different perspectives to why we are able to diversify and we are able to enhance our export competitiveness. Mm. How do we reverse it? How do we reverse it? Good question. You would notice across the continent that we have, um, there's no national level coordinate. There's something that Asians do very well that we don't do at mm. all. I had the opportunity of looking at working on South Korea's national development plan and comparing that to South Africa's national development plan and what South mm. Africa should change. We noticed that they have this long term 50 year agenda, which they implement in five year tranches, but they prepare for the next five years proactively. So they prepare the skill set they need. We assume the labor force has their skills. We assume the public sector has their skills, but they don't. So there's no national level coordination of the growth strategy with the industrial policy action plan, with the trade strategy, with the human capital development strategy. So what is our agenda for the next five years? What kind of skills do we need to implement that agenda? Do we have the skills? No, we need 50 more let's say pharmacists, we need 50 more, let's say doctors, we need 50 more petrochemical engineers, we need 100 more. Nobody's developing that. Nobody's coordinating that. So they give scholarships in that area to direct the youth there. So our human capital development and our trade strategy and our industrial policy action plan, our growth strategy and all the different strategies we have mm -hmm. are completely out of sync with each other and nobody puts the pieces together in terms of how they must be synchronized and proactively for that matter. To make sure we are ready 
but their strategies we design. We design strategies assuming that the skill, the skill set is already there, but the fact is it is not. That the infrastructure is there, it is not. That the technology requires already there, it is not. So there is no prior preparation and planning for the strategies that we design in terms of their implementation. That is why all the strategies we have in the different countries have not seen the light of day when it comes to implementation. Mm -hmm. There has to be some level of a national level planning and some intentionality in planning and coordination that charts the country. That you need a developmental and capable state mindset that drives the country in a certain direction mm -hmm. and, and make sure that we make progress in that direction. And so what you have is different electoral cycles, different presidents, different governments, different manifestos, different agenda, and the countries keep moving in circles. Mm -hmm. Right. Emmanuel, so one other thing, which is actually good news coming out of the ATI is that human well-being overall has improved um, across the continent. Um, whilst this is good news, I think that it also raises some questions. So how sustainable is right. this progress in, in human well-being and how do we ensure that it can be translated into inclusive and resilient growth? Right. In the, okay. Yeah. Before I even answer that, let me put a balance on what I've said earlier. Mm -hmm. Some countries did well. In a report of this nature, you see country level variations. Okay. Yeah. So countries like Tunisia, South Africa, Rwanda, Morocco. Um, have achieved much higher scores in the economic transformation. Yeah. Uh, they've transformed very well. Tunisia is well diversified. Uh, Rwanda's export strategy is phenomenal. Uh, Nigeria has improved in human well-being. Morocco is doing very well as well. So some countries are doing well. South Africa is one of the leading economies on the continent. Yeah. So some countries, are, a few of them are doing well. But the rest of us have a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. Human well-being is called the highest in the index, 42.5 on a scale of 0 to 100. Yeah. Um, that's good, but it's still very vulnerable to external shocks, as the COVID-19 showed us uh, recently. Um, so the, the variables that go into that, that index is income. Income per capita has increased over the sample period. Uh, inequalities have reduced. And female labor force participation has also improved over the sample period. So mm -hmm. it, it performed better than other sub indices. Um, the, the, the point though is that it is not vulnerable to external shocks. It's not resilient to external shocks, mm -hmm. as we saw in the COVID-19 or the global financial crisis or the end of the commodity super cycle. By the time each shock and each shock hits impacts on the African economies, human well-being declines. Okay. Now, how do we ensure that it is resilient? That's what the depth framework uh, Talk speaks to okay. If you can diversify your economy and produce a broader array of goods and services, mm -hmm. it means that your economy will not be vulnerable to external shocks. If there's a shock on one commodity or one a shock of a particular type, there are other drivers of growth that cushion the economy against the shock. So jobs are not lost massively. Maybe just one one sector. The other sectors are functioning and the economy is still growing and people can still keep their jobs. People can transition from a particular sector to another sector that is still functional. If your, if your exports are competitive, you earn a foreign exchange that, that stabilizes your currency, that, that beefs up your reserves, that fixes your current account, therefore the economy still grows. If your labor is productive, it means that it it's also strengthens growth as well. If your technology is, uh, is good, or you're improving your technology, you can, you can branch into uh, semi-processed goods you can branch and and and, and you tell a, a, a country to diversify it needs to have the technology to diversify it needs to have the technology to produce competitive products and then all of this together driven by other sectors that come beside that single <laughs> primary yeah. quality sector yeah. will make sure that human well-being is sustained and it, it's maintained and it's inclusive yeah. and sustainable awesome so the report also provides some insight into you know how African countries can cope with some of these shocks that you've you've just talked about and events like COVID, you right. know, climate effects and all of that. But because we both agree that these factors have they often when they they happen they derail our progress. You know, they so do. we move two steps forward and two steps backwards, right? right? So how can African countries? Um, develop resilience and adaptability okay the required level of um, resilience and adaptability to overcome some of these shocks and then how can we ensure that the progress that we we make 
are not reversed when reversed, when right. these these shocks happen. Right. right. So, so, so shocks have two effects. They, they they cause growth reversals and transformation reversals. Mm. Okay. Now resilience is a concept that can be looked at from two different perspectives. Uh, you can you can be resilient as a status. You know, there's a resilient economy, and there's resilience as a process. Okay. As a status, maybe you the impact of the shock is minimal, and you recover very quickly. Okay, but resilience as a process looks at your coping strategies, your adaptation strategies, and, your, and how to and your transformation strategies. Okay, so um, how, what strategies do you have to cope with the shock when it happens? Um, how can you adapt? What changes can you make, or do you have to make? How can you adapt to those changes as a new normal, or how can you transform the structural fundamentals of the economy to make sure that you are more cushioned? and strengthen against any such shocks in the future. Mm -hmm. If you look at the COVID, for instance, it showed how fragile our health and the educational systems were. So what have African countries done to make sure that another pandemic of that nature will not have an equally devastating effect? The sad thing is that we haven't done much. We haven't improved our hospital infrastructure. We haven't improved our vaccine production capabilities. Mm -hmm. We haven't improved our we have been diversified economy to make sure that when one sector is down, and when COVID came, there were lockdowns, there were uh, disruptions to trade value chains, supply chains. Um, there were there was lo there was uh, social distancing. Um, there was what else? Wearing of masks. There was uh, border closures. All kinds of the very harsh <laughs> measures. But to date, post COVID. I uh, hear still not gone, but let's say post-COVID, <laughs> African countries haven't done much to make sure the next health pandemic oh. does not have an equally devastating effect. We've seen Ebola, we've seen cholera, we've seen the other other pandemics, yeah. but COVID was different. So we still need to revisit that question: How can we ensure resilience? And the debt framework offers solutions to developing resilience. If you're well diversified and you are competitive export-wise and your labor is productive, mm -hmm. and your technology is upgraded, you become you are more versatile and more, more resilient to shocks of diverse kinds. There are two types of shocks. Shocks that emerge from economic origin mm -hmm. and non-economic origin. The economic origin shocks can easily be addressed, but the non-economic origin shocks like climate change phenomena or a health pandemic or political conflict, which I've seen across the Sahel region, mm -hmm. requires a different skill set, a different uh, strategic toolkit as countries. To be able to handle them. Yeah. It's, it's 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 interesting, you know, talking about some of these things. And we we're seeing the ATI as a diagnostic tool, right? So diagnosing where African countries are right. and all of that. But at the same time, it is also a prescriptive one. Right. So it offers best practices, policy recommendations, you know, advice for African countries to be able to transform their economies. So how can institutions like asset and development partners, for instance, how can we support African countries in this process of, you know, building the required resilience, mm -hmm. making sure that our growth is with debt? How can right. institutions like ours and our development partners support governments in this process? So besides the ATI, I said also that's what we call the country economic transformation outlooks, okay. <coughs> where we help countries to take a deeper dive into the structural fundamentals of the economy mm -hmm. and which sectors are worth opportunities lie for them to trigger transformation with the biggest, highest impact or what you call the transmission mechanism with the highest effects. Okay. okay. So the CITOS for we call them CITOS for short, country economic transformation outlooks. Okay. Now we're doing it for is uh, for Ghana, Zambia and Kenya at the moment. We are about to start with Senegal, Ethiopia and Tunisia. Now countries take a deep dive into the, the structure in the structures of the economy and identify with the government sector, with the key stakeholders, departments of state, uh, donor organizations, uh, civil mm -hmm. society, what have you. Uh, they come together and help the country to identify which sectors specifically could serve as winning sectors uh, through which transmission can be triggered to have a, a, a contagion effect or a spillover effect on the other sectors of the economy. Yeah. The other thing we also do is that you're asking countries to diversify. A country can ask you, where do I start from? What should I diversify? So we also do what you call the product space analysis. We'll look at the profile of the products that the country produces. Where do you have opportunities for expansion? Where do you have opportunities for integrating down the value chain 
either forward, yeah, forward down the value chain into semi-processed and processed goods. What are the, what are the avenues through which you can diversify your, your production? And so these two together, CEDOS and the product spill analysis, helps countries to to, cre to be creative and, and to actually take a deeper look into the economies and see where can I start from? What should I change? Which product should I focus on? Uh, where is there more demand but my supply is so little? Where are the rooms for expansion? What can I do? So specifics that countries can actually hold in mm -hmm. terms of what to do tomorrow morning. That's what we achieve through the CITOS and the product space analysis. Mm -hmm. So ASSET helps. And ASSET does research and policy advice yeah. from the research findings. So the policy advice you work is the, what we do through the CITOS and the product space analysis. Right. Yeah. And what kind of support is also needed from development partners? Funding. Oh. Funding. Most African countries require funding. First of all, fund those research projects, uh, develop the markets in develop, uh, improve the infrastructure, improve the technology, sustain energy supply, funding. Oh. Funding. And technical Very assistance. Important. Technical assistance. Oh. The development partners have technical assistance and tremendous experience from several countries that they have helped yeah. through their country assistance strategies oh. that they can bring to bear to any country yeah. that is now starting to address some of these issues. Right. Yeah. And that actually brings me to um, the last question that I have for you today on learning. So the ATI report is also a learning tool which you know allows African countries and leaders to learn from the past. Um, I like this saying that our founder KOI uses that if you if you know the beginning the well, well <laughs> the end will not will not um, frighten you. So it's important to learn how we've what we've done in the past what has worked and what not to be able to implement you know policy solutions that are transformative so if we look at the countries that we we worked on in the ati which of them have performed well um which ones need to improve what are some of the common challenges and opportunities that you you see um from the report that African countries, you know, can can learn from. So at least if I know, I know that my country is lagging behind in this sector and I see another country progressing in another, right. I can learn lessons from them. So can you tell us a bit about how these countries, you know, the good performers and those that are facing some challenges? Right. Apart from the early transformers in Asia, which we are trying to emulate, Tunisia has did very well on diversification. Mm -hmm. So countries can learn from what is Tunisia doing with diversification of, of production and exports. Uh, what is Rwanda doing with their phenomenal new export strategy? So the, these are examples that countries can learn. Nigeria has improved significantly on human well-being to social protection schemes and, and all that. South Africa is another, another example of a very uh, diversified, and, and um, in fact, South Africa accounts for 60% of intra-African trade. So we need to find out what are they doing right? How are they doing it? What can we learn from it? So there are so many, um, opportunities to learn, what you call learning by doing okay. on the continent. On assets side, you have what you call, we're trying to establish a community of practice in, in economic transformation. Mm -hmm. So we have the pact, we have a learning partnership as part of the CITOS, where we're going to learn from each other, from the six countries that we're we doing, uh, where can we cross-pollinate knowledge, where can we share experiences, where can we dialogue continuously, how can we dialogue continuously, uh, what are some of the lessons that we've learned in our individual country experiences, how can other countries learn from it. We need to leverage uh, these things to make sure that uh, countries learn from each other, they build up on what they have. You don't have to go through hell uh, if you know I've been through that junction before. I can tell you, how did you handle this? Oh, that's what I did. Yeah. So immediately you can, you can, yeah. you can, yeah. If you see South Africa is struggling with private, privatizing state-owned enterprises right now. Ghana has been there already. You've, you've crossed that bridge long time. So just when, how did you do it when you got there? That's what the pact, the opportunity for learning that the pact presents, or the peer learning part of the CITOS, yeah. that's opportunity presents. So there's so much, as I said, for a report of this nature, there are country variations. Uh, some countries did well in some dimensions, uh, others did well in other dimensions. So it offers an opportunity for countries, African countries, that are covered by the index to learn from each other. Apart from the report, there's also um, dashboards on our website where people can go and interact with the data and uh, look up specific country, how their own countries performed any country of interest performed and uh, where they did do all what they did and why yeah. the report details all those information there it's been exciting talking to you dr Ousu Seche. before you go i would ask you what would you say to our viewers um out there so 
policy makers across Africa, development partners, um, young people, how should they see this report or why should they care about the ATI? For the policymaker, let me take one at a time. <laughs> for, the, for the policymaker, the report gives you an opportunity to, to, to transform your economy through the growth with debt framework. So see how the, your country performed and see why your country did not perform well in the areas that did not perform well. See where your country performed well and see how you can strengthen it. Uh, see how other countries perform, what you can learn from them. And then uh, if you need a country economic transformation outlook, a deep dive into the structure fundamentals of economy and a product space analysis as it is available to offer the policy advisory services to your country in that regard. For development partners, do not stop funding good research. Now, as it's one of the key uh, Pan-African uh, think and do tank that you can rely on for a very solid and reliable um, research-based or evidence-based uh, data and, and research findings that, that can inform your country assistance strategies to African countries. It has to be driven by research. Uh, sometimes you find donors trying to repeat what has worked in country A, trying to repeat in country B. Uh, it's not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. There are country specific, uh, or there are country specificities that need to be addressed mm -hmm. in the specific country context. Mm -hmm. um, to the final of the ATI, you can see how the countries vary, um, where the emphasis should be for each specific country. Mm -hmm. And for civil society, uh, which other group do you mention again? No, civil society. <laughs> civil society yeah, yeah. We have a broad audience. Yes. So you can, you can society, go into the findings, look at what it says, see where you need to put pressure, where you need to lobby government to pay attention to. As I said earlier, there's no national level coordination of, of, of a commonly agreed a political development agenda. Mm -hmm. And that's what the compact is to achieve. Mm -hmm. The compact is to achieve an a political long-term development agenda that is coordinated by the state, irrespective of who is in power politically. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change. That's what the Asian transformers do. Mm -hmm. that we're trying to learn from them, but that's how they've done it. Mm -hmm. Whoever comes to the power implements the plan. You can only improve it after dinner, after, after, uh, uh, based on consensus. You can't throw it out of the window like we do, yeah. so the country doesn't move in circles. Yeah. It's always forward movement yeah. and backwards never. And lastly, for young people. For young people, <laughs> Africa is the youngest continent. Um, I think about 70% of the population are below the age of 30. Mm. That's a major challenge. For us to realize the dividend that that brings, there has to be jobs. There has to be jobs. Yeah. Um, their voices need to be heard much, much more. You find that most policies are done without the voice of the youth. They are sidelined. You can't plan for the youth without the youth. So they must, they must lobby to have their voices heard in the right corridors, what their needs are. If you take the average African presidency, it's, a, it's above 70 years. That is wrong. So most 70, 75 year old men I'm not in touch with the needs of what, 15 years, <laughs> so, so 15 to 24 years. So we need to get more of the youth in positions that matter. They need to get their voices heard, they need to make more noise, they need to find avenues to express themselves so that their needs can be better attended to. Yeah. At the moment, the age, average age of our leadership and the direction of our policy and national interest does not include the youth at all. Yeah. And we cannot realize the dividends that we need to realize if the jobs are not there. Sure. Or the needs the youth are not taken into account. Right. And the ATI gives them a tool the that they can that use to advocate. Ad ad absolutely. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're on the time bomb yeah. because the youth population is increasing, okay. economic prospects are declining. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's been great talking to you, Dr. Lucy Setre. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today on the African Transformation Spotlight. We will bring this conversation to an end here, but we will be coming your way again with more. Um, from our experts and our, our network. So watch us again on the African Transformation Spotlight. But until then, my name is Belinda Ayamga and I'll come your way again.